Okay, so we're going to kind of look at some of the events that led up to the American Revolution. So this is kind of the seeds of unrest, some things that are going on following the French and Indian War, um, and some underlying tensions that are existing within the colonies that kind of lead to eventually the American Revolution, which is kind of signified with 1776. So we're going to talk about that. So if you've got your worksheet or whatever, just kind of follow along um, and stop, pause, whatever you need to do to, to kind of keep up. So we've kind of already discussed that after the French and Indian War, um, a lot of the American settlers wanted basically to open up new lands to settlement, these colonists, because pretty much the French had been kicked out of North America. Now these lands belong to mainly the British. And, uh, but at the same time, the government of, of Great Britain feared that these would just cause more conflicts with the Native Americans that reside, resided on the interior around the Great Lakes and so forth. So oftentimes they did not get access to that. So that's one of the ter territorial disputes. Also at this point, the Native Americans had angered, were really angered by British policies after the war. Um, basically they had been limited the amount of ammunition and rum that they were able to tra available to trade at this point, which kind of upset them at that time. And they also weren't being presented the, the annual gifts that the French would give them. Um, so they're not being supplied these gifts that they thought that they were entitled to. And some of them saw these goods and gifts as payment for allowing the colonists to use their land. So it's kind of like they're trespassing on their land. So you can see the disputes that are going between the Native Americans and the settlers who are trying to make it to um, the interior of North America. And also at the same time, we had too many settlers moving into the western lands, which the natives believe belonged to them at this point. So there's conflicts developing there. And we'll see that one of these conflicts erupts into what is known as Pontiac's Rebellion. So right as the French and Indian War is closing in 1763, Pontiac's Rebellion breaks out. So this, this chief of the Ottawa tribe, he's basically uniting the tribes in a war against British, kind of like we saw with King Philip's War. Um, wanted to end British settlements in the West, because the West at this point really isn't the West we think of today. This is mainly going to be parts of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and getting up into modern-day Detroit area around the Great Lakes and so forth. So as a result of that, they destroyed British forts in the Ohio Valley and killed around 2,000 settlers. Uh, the result of this that you need to understand is that the British had military control over the Native American lands in the West from this point on, so they're still going to create more forts and fortify those areas, but it really kind of shook the nerve of the people and made them a little bit worried, especially the British government, and worried about more settlers going into that area causing more wars. And as you can see, here's a depiction um, of Pontiac and where the various wars and rebellion broke out. So you can see the various forts that were attacked, and a lot of this, as we can see, is up in that Detroit area um, around Lake Michigan um, and Lake Erie and so forth within the Lake, Great Lakes region. Um, but that's where a lot of those are going to occur, and as a result of it, made, made the British a little bit worried about future attacks and allowing settlers in there. But pretty much as a result of this, a lot of the lands will be taken from the Native Americans in this region. So basically a reaction to Pontiac's Rebellion is going to be the proclamation line of 1763, or sometimes just called Proclamation of 1763 which barred settlement west of the Appalachian Mountains. So you're not allowed to cross those mountains unless you've got permission, and permission was rarely granted to the settlers because they didn't want to start any wars. But fur traders also had to get royal okay, as I mentioned, before entering the frontier, so you have to get that permission. And troops will be stationed along the frontier to protect the settlers. So a lot of these people are angry about fighting the French and Indian War, and now they don't have access to the lands that they believe they deserved in fighting that war. So it's this kind of reaction to Pontiac's Rebellion. They're trying to keep wars from breaking out. And as a result of that, it's really just angling, angering the colonists at this point because it's cutting off settlement to the west. So as you can kind of see here with the depiction on the map, the line pretty much runs right around this region right in here, which is the Appalachian Mountains. So it's this kind of territorial area that the colonies feel like they're being constricted to that region and they can't go settle into the lands out here that they pretty much felt like they were fighting for. Um, and Pontiac's Rebellion, as I mentioned, kind of happened in these areas. Um, and so as a result of that, there's a little bit of anger and tension growing from the, the colonists between them and the British government. So with that proclamation of 1763, it's very difficult to enforce. I and mean, that's a long barrier um, to try and fortify and keep the colonists out. So colonial governors were land hungry, so they don't really enforce it at that point because they want more lands, they want to expand their colonies, 
and oftentimes they know people who want these lands and sometimes they would pay them off and whatever to get those lands. So it's not really enforced. And it's also deeply resented by the colonists um, because they helped British win the new lands fighting in the French and Indian War. They, so they felt they had rights to those lands and as a result of it, some ignored the law and settled there anyway, which could cause confrontations, not only as defiance between them, the colonists and the British government, but also at the same time, it really shows that, you know, they really feel that they deserve those lands and ignoring the law and perhaps running into rebellions with maybe the natives at that point. Okay, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit with the French and Indian War, with the results of that war and the effects of that war. Now we have a huge war debt, and you have to pay that off somehow. So they needed money to protect and secure the frontier too. So all these things, you've got to raise revenue. So results placed heavy taxes on American colonies. There's been taxes, but a lot of those taxes were initiated by the colonies themselves, which had elected officials there. Now these new taxes that are being kind of increased or, or, or implemented on the colonies oftentimes come from Parliament, which really angered the colonists because they don't have direct representation in Parliament. So some of these things are adding up. The financial situation in Britain is kind of struggling, so now they have to impose new taxes and collect those taxes and enforce those navigation laws or navigation acts that they had on the books at this point, which only infuriates a lot of the colonists. Okay, one of those acts is known as the Sugar Act, which passes directly after the French and Indian War in 1764. So it was a duty, which is an import tax. So whenever you bring something in, it has a tax on it, on foreign molasses and sugar entering the colonies. So the British tried to strictly enforce the law. Um, and that was something that never really happened before because of that salutary neglect. So before most taxes not enforced, but British now needed money. So inspectors would search your home. So it would actually physically go into your homes, sometimes in search to see um, what items you had, if they had actually been brought in illegally, because sometimes people would find perhaps French sugar at a cheaper price. So now they're only supposed to buy British sugar. They would um, inspect ships and warehouses for smuggled goods. So it basically hurts a lot of the colonial merchants and ship owners at this point. And so colonists start protesting and continue to smuggle goods anyway. So they're going to find a black market and another outlet to get those goods to the people who demand them so the customers are still there. But they're, they don't want to be collecting taxes, so they're finding new avenues or routes around that. Okay, so we've talked about a series of, of various taxes. Another one's going to be known as the Stamp Act, which passes the next year in 1765. Um, stamps had to be bought and placed on documents, newspapers, playing cards, etc. It's a laundry list of things that it had to be placed on. And it affected all colonists, not just the merchants at this point. So a lot of lawyers are affected by this because it deals with the documentation, and that really upset them. And you don't want to upset lawyers because they know the law. It was passed by Parliament where colonists had no representation again, and the British said that the colonists had virtual representation. Basically, they're arguing that they represent all colonists at this point, kind of like you would say that right now you can't vote necessarily for your local senator or uh, congressman altogether, but they say that they virtually represent you, that they still have you in mind when they pass laws that may affect, affect you, like Joshua's law, which affects drivers, but you can't vote on whether that law occurs or pick the people who delegate that law. Um, because Parliament at this point represented all British subjects, but they're not buying that because they don't have a representative in office in Parliament, which really entices more anger um, and resentment towards the government. So the Stamp Act pretty much affixed to all documents, and that that affects everyone at this point, not just merchants. So as you can kind of see here, the various kind of depictions of it um, and the stamp that would be affixed to something shown that somebody has paid that tax, and since it has that stamp on it, then it is legal. If not, it would be considered contraband or smuggled or, or illegal at that point. So when there's tension, there's obviously going to be some form of protest. The colonists oftentimes protested. So merchants would sign non-importation agreements where they wouldn't import stuff. So they promised not to buy or import British goods, kind of like a boycott. So basically, if you didn't like the cafeteria's food, you could just bring your own or not buy from the cafeteria. That's one way of boycotting or not purchasing, and maybe that would change their minds. So some protests actually get very violent. Some stamp agents resign because of fear of their lives and being killed making enforcement very difficult at this point. So sometimes it was not a good job to have um, as a stamp agent because people would hunt you down because of what you're doing and they felt that it was wrong and they were being wrong at that point. One of these such groups um, is going to be known that is very openly protesting this. is known as the Sons of Liberty. So it's a various group of people from artisans, lawyers, merchants, and politicians 
basically formed this group to protest the Stamp Act, um, and they're pretty well known. Some people will talk about um, individually. So use pamphlets, petitions, and public meetings to gain support, and they're also going to be very violent. Sometimes if you've looked at some of these cartoons and these depictions, um, what they did to these people by tar and feathering them or hanging them or hanging uh, something that resembled them, a symbol of effigy, was a very harsh, violent thing that they did to these people. There's also one account, apparently, of pouring hot, boiling tea down somebody's throat to kill them, one of these agents. One of these people is going to be Samuel Adams. Um, he led the Boston unit of the Sons of Liberty, and he was also known for propaganda um, and getting the public very influenced by this against the British, and he did really well of it. He becomes kind of one of the leaders eventually, even later on in the American Revolution, as we'll see. So as you can tell here, there's an individual being hung up by their trousers on the left, um, so it's a lot of hatred and animosity there. And then the other picture on the right is a person who's been tarred in feather, and that would kill you oftentimes because tar is boiling hot, and then they're boiling, got boiling hot tea being poured down their throat, which there kind of looks like vomiting. And then behind it says the Tree of Liberty, and it looks like they're about to be hanged by it. So there's multiple ways of them using violence to kind of show their protest against the government. And some of these people were considered enemies of the state or terrorists at that point against the British government. So eventually, instead of using necessarily violent protests, they formed what is known as the Stamp Act Congress in 1765. So nine colonies sent delegates. They were basically objecting the Stamp Act and denying Parliament's right to tax them. And so they started vo organizing boycotts against British goods. And this is basically a step towards that unified resistance against them, which will be very important later on during the American Revolution. So you can see that there are more civil ways of protesting um, what's going on with the Stamp Act, and what that will be is called the Stamp Act Congress. So that the boycotts that they enact actually are very good. They hurt the British merchants, and so as a result of that, those merchants call on Parliament, and eventually they'll have to repeal the Stamp Act in 1766. So that was a good form of civil disobedience, I guess you could say, and protest by the colonists at that point by forming the Stamp Act Congress, which actually results in a positive thing where they repeal it, which means they take it back or take it off the books. Okay, we've talked about how the colonies sometimes had a little bit autonomy or independence or freedom to kind of govern themselves. Well, the Declaratory Act is passed in 1766, which actually says that Parliament had full legislative authority over the colonies in all matters. So now Parliament's telling all the colonies what to do, what laws they have. So now they're kind of regulating the colonies more directly, and that's really angering and frustrating these colonists. And another event is going to be known as the Townsend Acts, named after Charles Townsend, who is actually kind of like the guy who ran the budget of England, um, also known as Champagne Charlie, I believe. Passed in 1767, uh, import duties on tea, lead, glass, and paint. So it's a variety of items enforced through use of writs of assistance. And basically these are general search warrants allowing customs officers to search any ship, warehouse, or home based on suspicion of smuggled goods. So basically you don't have the idea of, it's like we think of illegal search and seizure, like police officers just can't search you. They have to have cause or reason. Right now, they're just basically going in anywhere if they want to and kind of upholding these laws. So colonial courts sometimes refuse to issue these writs, which is good, but it's repealed in 1770, except for the tax on tea, as we'll see. And they tried to sneak that one through. So Parliament wanted to show that they still could tax the colonies, and that's kind of the way that they'll see this happening at this point. And it really still frustrates the colonists that they're still directly taxing them. And we'll see some resistance in shortly with the Boston Tea Party and other events. Now, the Quartering Act, which is actually still kind of on the books, which is known as our th uh, Third Amendment right, is basically you don't have to quarter troops. Because in 1765, the British government sent more troops to keep the colonists in line. So they're sending them there to protect them, they say, to keep order. So the act, as a result, colonists had to quarter or house and supply British troops at their homes. So basically a British troop could come in and stay in your home and eat your food. Well, that really angered a lot of the colonists because they don't feel like they should be there in the first place. Plus, they're now housing and feeding these individuals, and sometimes tensions flared. So many colonial legislatures refused to do this, but the British Parliament said that they had the right to do it. And so you can see how basically the contract between the colonists and the British government is starting to break down. Okay, Boston becomes the hub or the most active center for protest during this time. So in 1768, the Massachusetts legislature wrote a letter protesting taxation without representation. So early on, people are 
uh, using this as their battle cry, um, saying that this is not fair, we need representation if we're going to be taxed. So at least let us have a voice in this. Sent letter to other colonies for support at this point, and British dissolved Massachusetts legislature as a response to that. So basically, they think that Boston and the Massachusetts legislature is being very defiant, so they pretty much just said that they could no longer meet, and they're basically losing their charter and their ability to kind of unite as a group, and they're trying to um, decrease their power and influence at this point. So we talked about the Sons of Liberty. In Boston, we see the creation of the Daughters of Liberty, which refused to buy tea. And so what they did is they used local herbs to make their own tea. So that's a form of boycotting. It's not violent. It's a rather civil way of protesting. They also had spinning parties where they would get together and make their own cloth. Because at this point, as I've mentioned, you're supposed to buy all your cloth from Britain. So by making your own cloth, it is hurting those merchants and those factories over there in England and making you less reliant upon their goods. And it's a boycott to hurt their economy. Um, eventually, there will be some violent protests, though. Smashed British ships, attacked customs agents, and tarred and feathered smuggling informants. And this is just basically going to be some of the violent protests in Boston at this point. But the Daughters of Liberty are pretty civil, but you have this violent protest where ships are being attacked and so forth, and, and agents tarred and feathered and so forth. Okay, here's a tombstone basically recognizing the individuals involved with the Boston Massacre. So we'll talk about that next. As you can see, um, within this is Crispus Attucks, which is going to be a person of African-American descent who dies during the Boston Massacre. And there's different accounts of it, and who's right and who's wrong and so forth, and we'll talk about that. So, because of so much British presence and so many soldiers there, tensions flare up. It'd be like an administrator being at your house and following you everywhere. It just got to the point where people were tired of it, especially in Boston. So on March 5th, 1775, colonists are killed outside of a customs house by British troops. One of those, as I mentioned, was Christmas Attucks, African Americans killed. Um, and a lot of the colonists are enraged because these colonists are unarmed and being killed and shot at by armed British soldiers. So the British soldiers were tried for murder. Um, they were actually defended by John Adams, who was a very eloquent, good lawyer. Two convicted and branded on the hands and released. But for the most part, they're not really going to be charged for these heinous crimes, or at least what they felt to be heinous crimes. And a lot of the colonists felt like the British government, um, it was corrupt, and that these people got off on the charges and didn't necessarily get punished for their actions of shooting what they believed to be innocent um, civilians and so forth. Um, but there's a little bit behind it. They probably definitely threw snowballs at them and they're enticing them and probably even threw rocks at them and as a result of that things escalated and some people got shot as a result. So that's going to be the summary of this part of the chapter um, and good luck.